Um, so while everybody is joining, I'd like to um, say hello, everybody. It's lovely to have you all with us. Um, welcome to the BSA, essentially. For those of you unfamiliar with us, we're a UK-based charity um, whose object is to conduct, facilitate, and promote research in Greece in all periods and across all arts, humanities, and social science disciplines. And we do that in lots of different ways through uh, support of our students, through provision of a, uh, an amazing library, amazing facilities through the Fitch Laboratory, which is coming up for its 2024, its 50th anniversary next year. So that's a huge excitement for us all. Um, we, I mean, our main base, as you probably know, is in Athens, but we have a, a kind of a, a satellite base uh, satellite Research Centre in Knossos on Crete, and at the moment our curator Knossos is um, trying to uh, get started on moving all the finds out of the Stratigraphic Museum in preparation for the rebuilding of the Stratigraphic Museum, and lots of you have been great supporters of that, and, and, and we're very grateful for that as well. Um, at some point, if you get a chance, you might like to explore our website, which has recently been updated through the great work of Miles Stevenson, our uh, Executive Development Officer, and uh, Yanis, our IT Officer here in Athens, and there's new uh, uh, images and, and new material to look at. So um, what I will do now is hand over to Marie-Christine, who will take you through the protocols, and um, thank you, Philippa for being with us and uh, we're really looking forward to your lecture and uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much. Right, just the protocols of the Zoom lecture. Um, other than the speaker and myself, well, Flora as the host, um, all the microphones are off by default. Throughout the talk, two features are available, a chat feature that looks like a single speech bubble that allows you to type text which can be read by other participants, as well as by the lecturer and the host. You can use this if you experience any difficulty, and my co-host Flora will try to assist uh, remotely. Otherwise, we will ignore comments in chat, but feel free to comment to each other during the talk. A Q&A feature that looks like two speech bubbles, one on top of the other, into which you can type questions for the speaker. Only you, the speaker, and the host can see these. And after the lecture finishes, Philip has very kindly agreed to answer questions, and I will read out a selection of questions received and our speaker will respond. You should see a small window in the top right of your screen. If this gets in your way, you can mouse over it and either move it around your screen, or you can click on the bars above it to make it smaller. I hope this is all clear. It doesn't sound desperately clear, but I hope it is. And I will repeat the question and answer protocol at the end of the lecture. Now, it is my huge pleasure to introduce Pippa Steele. For somebody who's so relatively young, there's an awful lot to say about her, and I want to say a lot of it. So please be bear with me. Dr. Philippa Steele is a Senior Research Associate at the Faculty of Classics, University of Cambridge, and Senior Research Fellow at Magdalen College. She's previously published widely on the languages and writing systems of ancient Cyprus and the Bronze Age Aegean, and her most recent book, together with Philip Boys, was Understanding Relations Between Scripts, Volume 2, Early Alphabets. Following a British Academy Fellowship and Evans Pritchard Lectureship at All Souls College, Oxford, she won a large grant from the ERC in 2016 to run the six year project called Context of and Relations Between Early Writing Systems, known as CRUISE, with a focus on writing around the Aegean, Eastern Mediterranean, Near East and North Africa. She won a further large ERC grant in 2022, which has led to her current project, Visual Interactions in Early Writing Systems, known as VIEWS. Uh, this is to work on writing systems from linear A and B and cuneiform to Egyptian hieroglyphs and even Mayan. The aim of the project is to understand the relationship between writing and visual culture and the ways in which people encounter and interact dynamically with writing. 
It has also led to the establishment of the Endangered Writing Network. Finally, Philippa is an enthusiastic supporter of International Lego Classicism Day, and in 2021 was honored with a Lego figure in recognition of her outreach work. So I'm delighted to hand the floor to Dr. Steele for her talk, the title of which is The Vitality of Writing Traditions in the Bronze Age Aegean and Iron Age Cyprus and their unexpected relevance for the modern day. Philippa. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Marie Christine for the wonderful introduction and thank you to Rebecca as well. Um, and to the BSA in general for um, inviting me to speak this evening. So this evening I want to present some research that has been developing during the two projects that um, Marie-Christine just mentioned. Uh, so the previous project, CRUISE, and the present project, VIEWS, you don't have to remember what the acronyms stand for, I think I'll bring up the names later. Uh, which have both been hosted here in Cambridge. I'm going to be focusing on writing systems in the Bronze Age Aegean and in largely Iron Age Cyprus, a little bit Bronze Age Cyprus as well, focusing on the issue of vitality, which I will come back to um, shortly. In other words, um, what keeps a writing tradition alive and what ensures its success and its longevity or otherwise, as the case may be. I'll begin with the map which centres Crete and the Aegean, and you can see off to the east the island of Cyprus, which um, is very close to the Levantine coast. Over in Cyprus, syllabic writing from the Aegean was adopted in the Late Bronze Age. So that's very much part of the sort of geographical sphere that we'll be looking at this evening. Now in the Aegean, there are three particular writing systems that are of interest. Cretan hieroglyphic, linear A and linear B. So I've given here very rough absolute dates because I think the absolute dates are a little bit more accessible than the archaeological dating. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, however, that these are dates of attestation, so what we have from archaeological remains. And to some extent, we, you know, we, we may think that some of the traditions lasted a little bit longer than we can see in the archaeological record. Depends very much um, on the evidence for, for each one, which sometimes is open to interpretation. I've also given a very um, brief summary of the kinds of objects that are inscribed in each of these writing systems, but we'll come back to that in much more detail very shortly. Over in Cyprus, there are then two further writing systems that are of interest, Cipro Minoan, which belongs to the Bronze Age, and then Cypriot Syllabic, the Cypriot Syllabic script, which was used much later than the other writing systems of, these, of this family. So these writing systems are all related to each other very closely. They're all classified as being syllabic, or we could say logosyllabic in some cases. The Cypriot syllabic script is the last one to flourish and then disappear, and was in use throughout most of the first millennium BCE. So we'll start off with some perspectives. The two projects that have been mentioned already, crews and views, both lend various kinds of um, disciplinary perspectives and uh, various research questions to this endeavour. Crews, so context of and relations between early writing systems, focused on two particular issues how writing systems are related to each other, which involves looking at borrowings, at adaptations, at shared features. And secondly, the ways in which the social and cultural context of writing 
are important to understanding both the writing systems and the practices surrounding them. Now with the views project, visual interactions in early writing systems. I'm turning towards visual aspects of writing, both in terms of the visual features of the systems and also in terms of the existing the existence of writing in wider visible landscapes. Um, so in connection with the latter point, a term that I'll be um, coming back to in this paper is social visibility. Now, we could think of social visibility as an aspect of literate culture that perhaps has more to do with exposure to writing than to competence in it. So we're not only concerned with how many people can read and write, but also the question of to whom writing is visible and perhaps to whom it is valuable. Um, and it may indeed have some value for people who can't read it. I also want to mention a very modern problem, um, which is something that I hope my research will be intersecting with as time goes on. That modern problem has to do with writing traditions in the modern day that are under threat. So did you know that as many as perhaps 80% of the world's writing systems are thought to be under threat, so threatened with loss? Globally, writing is dominated by a small number of hugely successful writing systems, be it the Roman alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, Devanagari, Cyrillic, Chinese, etc. We can probably all also think of a few systems that are associated with smaller groups or single languages like the Greek alphabet, Armenian, Ge'ez, Japanese, etc. However, Against this landscape, minority indigenous and endangered languages can really struggle to find an accepted written form. And many more recently developed systems are in danger of being lost. Now, this can also contribute to the loss of the languages themselves, since writing is seen as essential to the maintenance of, of languages in part because we, we need something in order to produce educational materials and educational materials are important for making sure that a language is passed on to more users and to future generations. So what does that have to do with my research? Well, can research on ancient writing help? I would say there's potential for it to do so, and that's something that I'm continuing to explore at the moment. The ancient world provides us with numerous examples of writing systems that didn't survive antiquity, as well as ones that obviously did. Because we often have fairly long-term records in the ancient past, we therefore have an opportunity to study the long-term trajectory of such writing traditions and to understand periods when they had higher vitality, as well as what led to their eventual loss for the ones that were lost. The concept of vitality is one that I'm largely borrowing from research on endangered languages. And um, so here you can see a schema that was created by UNESCO for trying to measure the vitality of a language. So it's vitality and its degree of endangerment or vulnerability to loss. That includes issues like intergenerational transmission, numbers of speakers, proportion of speakers, the domains of use and ability to adapt to new domains of use the availability of materials for education, governmental and institutional attitudes and policies, also crucially community members' attitudes, and finally, the type and quality of documentation. So how much do we know about a language? Um, and this is a good structure for thinking about the endangerment of languages. There are, however, 
numerous other frameworks that have been applied. So this is by no means the only one, but it's a widely used one. Now, language and writing are obviously different things, or maybe it's not obvious since we very often conflate them when we talk about one or the other. Writing particularly is marked by the need for particular kinds of skills, materials, resources, um, and also by its kind of social context, the fact that it's something that includes embodied practice. So it's very different from language. And if you if you think about it, everyone in this society is quite likely to speak a language, but not everyone in the society will necessarily be able to write. That takes a different kind of education and training. So we might be able to adapt this framework to think about the vitality of writing traditions specifically. Remember that for the ancient world, we can't just talk to people. So it's harder to find out about language in some ways, or it's always mediated through uh, writing um, because writing is what survives to us. So I've put here another kind of schema for thinking about um, how we might approach vitality in terms of writing traditions, looking at who could write, whether writing was restricted to certain groups, what writing was used for, and whether it was restricted to particular domains, how writing was done, what materials and media it required, how writing was passed on, whether learning was targeted at certain groups, what ideology surrounded writing and was it controlled by certain groups and finally were there detectable changes in any of the above over time which might explain changes in the sort of level of vitality okay so that's enough of the sort of theoretical aspect i'm now going to focus a bit more closely on the writing systems in question to try and think about how they compare with each other in terms of what we can say about their potential vitality. The first, Cretan hieroglyphic, is in many ways the hardest to assess. So we only have around 300 inscriptions surviving, um, depending on exactly what is counted as an inscription, which is not actually that straightforward in some cases, particularly the seals. Writing seems to have grown out of seal use. Um, so the, the top two pictures here are seals of various shapes, um, usually made in stone, which bear inscriptions. Um, seals are not the only inscribed items, they also coexist with writing on clay documents. And if you think about it, writing on clay is a bit different from writing on a seal, because when you have a seal, you don't have any choice about the inscription after it's been made. You can only impress that inscription, um, which is going to be meaningful in one or more contexts, probably administrative contexts. Whereas if you write directly on clay, you have free choice over what you can write, potentially. So there are some differences there between these two traditions within Cretan hieroglyphic. Um, so in the middle there, you can see uh, one kind of clay document, a clay bar, um, and bottom left, a medallion. And there are various other um, clay document shapes that were in use. Seal use was evidently closely connected with administration um, because you know we, we actually see clay documents frequently um, impressed with inscribed seal impressions for one thing that you know that tells us that these are um, sets of practices that are intended to overlap and to work in synergy. There are also a very small number of apparently non-administrative inscriptions um, on clay and stone vessels, but that it really is a small number for Cretan hieroglyphic. And um, I, I also thought I would um, briefly mention that we also have a clay 
administrative document from the sanctuary site at Katasimi, which is um, written in what looks very much like Cretan hieroglyphic. Now, that looks odd. Um, so does this mean that we have administrative writing of some kind within a religious context, religious administration perhaps? It's a, only a one-off find, so it's very difficult to understand that context. And the final point to make on Cretan hieroglyphic is that it's very difficult to tell what eventually happened to it. Partly because the dating of the last deposits have been questioned to some extent, um, and partly because there's a chronological and partial geographical overlap with linear A, which is not very well understood. So exactly what the differences between Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A in those early stages, something where we have to rely on a certain amount of um, of theorizing really because um, the, the evidence is sort of open to question to some extent. I'll move on to linear A. Um, linear A has much more potential for analysis in terms of the vitality of, um, of writing traditions. We have more like 1500 inscriptions in linear A so the the sheer number helps a little bit. Clay documents are by far the most numerous, especially clay tablets like the one on the right here. Now, sealing practices do continue, or they're, they're also important in linear A administration. However, we, we don't see for linear A inscribed seals. So there are, there are no seals with writing on. Um, seals with writing on are basically confined to Cretan hieroglyphic. In linear A, um, seals are used, but they have pictorial and narrative motifs um, rather than writing on them. Um, and the, there's, it's also worth saying there's a kind of visual difference between Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, which is exactly why Arthur Evans gave them these two different names in the first place. So although there's chronological overlap between them, Cretan hieroglyphic signs, especially on seals, but also to some extent on the clay documents, have a slightly more kind of pictorial or elaborate nature to them. Um, that's something that I, I won't sort of go into in any real detail. So linear A is, as it sounds, more, more linear looking. Now, linear A inscriptions, as well as being found in administrative contexts, are also found on a wide range of objects that are not clay documents. And this is where we have scope to try and understand how widely writing was being used and for what purposes. A variety of clay vessels bear inscriptions, some of which are probably administrative, others may be more decorative. So it, the middle left inscription here, um, which is not, not a brilliant photo, but this is a, a, a ceramic cup with a sort of spiral inscription um, a De Pinto, in fact, around the inside, so it's painted inscription. That looks much more decorative and probably much more related to usage. So it reminds me a little bit of um, in the later Greek traditions, for instance, where you'd have an inscription inside a cup, um, perhaps a, um, an image inside a cup that would only be visible as you drain the cup. Um, so that, that speaks to sort of some kind of interactivity with the object as well. Some inscribed items are clearly prestige items like the gold ring here in the top left. Um, there are also uh, silver and gold pins with, um, with inscriptions. Um, and the gold and silver axes from the Arkalakuri uh, cave. Um, so one here in the top right. The fact that some of these items were discovered in tombs, so the jewellery items in particular, 
does rather suggest that they had some kind of status as personal items of display. And it's also worth pointing out that a lot of these items may be ones where uninscribed versions are fairly common, um, which makes you wonder exactly what the inscription does for the object. And it seems to me that the inscription may be seen as adding value in some sense. And that may also relate to wider attitudes towards literacy and towards writing in general. Now, out of the non-administrative inscriptions, many come from ritual contexts, including the axes just mentioned. So I've done a sort of reshuffle of, um, of the inscriptions here. Top left now is a figurine which has some writing around the skirt. Uh, it's a broken figurine, so we don't actually see what, what the, the top part um, looked like, but um, the, there is a, a painted inscription around the skirt of the figurine. So that, that again looks like a sort of religious um, context probably, though inscribed figurines are very rare. There's only this example and one other. The middle and bottom right um, are two examples of the most frequently found non-administrative inscriptions namely the inscribed stone vessels, uh, which are typically known as libation bowls. There's quite a bit of variation in their morphology and, and type. So we have um, nearly 50 examples of inscribed libation bowls. Actually, that means that they constitute only a small proportion of existing li libation vessels. So again, an item where you can have them inscribed or uninscribed and we may wonder what the inscription adds to an object that could um, exist without writing. Nevertheless, this is a significant body of material pointing towards literacy in the religious sphere and even more importantly, these objects suggest some exposure to writing during ritual activities since we assume that they were actually used in ritual, though exactly what a libation meant in this context is not something that I'm going to reflect on in, in too much detail, but it's an interesting question, especially because the, um, the, the bowls are often quite shallow and you wonder sort of exactly um, what they may have contained and how effectively. And um, finally, I included um, this ring on the bottom left, there's a, a gold seal ring, not because it has an inscription, which it doesn't, but because it shows an image of um, a figure who is probably a goddess or a priestess holding an instrument with a long handle and a circular terminus. Now, that item was long thought to be a mirror, um, but more recently, this object that the priestess or goddess is holding has been reinterpreted as a sort of scepter, some kind of instrument that would have been used in ritual activity. And in fact, an object of this shape has been found at Knossos bearing a very long linear A inscription. I haven't included images of that because it hasn't yet been published, though I have seen uh, pictures of the object. Again, this object is most plausibly interpreted as having a ritual context and its inscription is significant. So it may be that the text would have been read out if a priestess may have been involved in um, kind of using the object and perhaps mediating its message to a religious audience, then there may also have been some degree of orality, maybe reading out the inscription or parts of it to the audience. That could also mean that we have literate people involved in religion for whom their literacy is kind of a part of their religious role. So we have 
hints here it's it's difficult to um to be exact about the details of course but we have hints here at a social visibility for writing that goes beyond the administrative sphere finally it's important to mention that for linear a uniquely in the aegean um, we have direct evidence of the use of parchment for writing. So flat based nodules, so sort of um, pieces of clay that were used to, um, to seal something. Some of these have been found to preserve impressions of the pores in parchment and also fibres from some kind of cord probably used to tie up the parchment. So these seem to be sealed parchment documents. Another type of nodule, the hanging nodule, has also been suggested perhaps to have been attached to parchment documents, but the evidence is less direct um, in that case. However, this makes it very clear that there are documents that existed in linear A writing traditions that we don't have that have not survived antiquity um, and that you know we will never have direct access to because the climate isn't really right for preserving that sort of thing. Um, now to some extent we can speculate about what might have been in such documents so what might we be missing most frequently found is the suggestion that there may have been archives and um, so some kind of administrative writing in these documents um, but it could also be that there were other genres did people use parchment for letters private letters diplomatic correspondence um, could there even have been literature written on parchment well it's very difficult to say we're in the realms of speculation but since we can tell that those objects existed it does mean that there's something to speculate about. Um, parchment is only one possible perishable material. Papyrus was popular around the Mediterranean. Could that have been used too? And wood was very common as well. Um, so we have good evidence for the use of hinged wooden writing tablet, sorry, of, of hinged wooden writing tablets, such as that found in the Uluburun shipwreck, uh, which is from the 14th century BC, so slightly later than uh, Linear A. Um, but this is a trading vessel carrying Cypriot and other goods, which perhaps may have been heading to the Aegean. Now, there have been some bronze hinges. So the Uluburun uh, writing tablet has ivory hinges but we might expect bronze hinges also to have been used. And some bronze hinges found at Zakros on Crete, uh, which were originally thought to be the hinges from boxes, have been suggested to originate from wooden writing tablets. The fact that they were found in areas associated with clay documents as well could also lend weight to that idea. Um, but of course, we're again in the realms of speculation to some extent. I'm now going to move on from linear A to linear B. I've got quite a bit of material to cover, so excuse me if I go quite fast. In linear B, almost all surviving inscriptions, of which we have more like 6,000, so an even greater number, however, an even smaller proportion of inscriptions outside of the administrative sphere. Almost everything is on clay documents for linear B. We do have, so here's a couple of pictures of clay tablets. Um, we do have a small number of inscribed stirrup jars, or so about 120 examples. And these bear dipinti, so painted inscriptions. While the writing may look comparatively decorative in comparison with linear beyond clay, these inscriptions are essentially administrative, or most of them seem to be, and they relate to the storage and movement of whatever was contained in the stirrup jars. Quite possibly also intended for an audience of elite consumption, and that may have been a reason 
again for the appearance of writing on um in in such a sort of visible context on these objects but these are quite limited um any inscriptions on other objects other than a very small number of um vessels or vessel fragments with um with short inscriptions are one-offs so um the seal at the top here from Midian um, and the stone block at the bottom from Dimony, which is up in Thessaly. So, you know, on the fringes of um, areas using Linear B. These look completely out of place with the rest of the tradition. And they're slightly odd in the sense that, you know, they don't look like graffiti or evidence of wider literacy. In fact, more likely to be related to perhaps um, elite usage in the case of the seal, perhaps something administrative in the case of the stone block here. So a few conclusions and to conclude also on linear B. Uh, so we saw that for Cretan hieroglyphic, the situation is a little bit difficult to judge. For linear A, Writing clearly shows signs of vitality outside of the administrative sphere. So it's especially in religious practice that we can begin to uh, reconstruct some social visibility for writing. But Linear B shows no sign of this wider usage or value. Linear B um, never appears on um, items that we can closely connect with religion, for example, looks as though Mycenaean religion is illiterate in comparison with um, with that of the Minoan world. The restriction of writing and its spheres of usage over time um, looks quite convincing from the case of Linear B. Now, we've seen that there could be potentially documents on perishable materials in any of these systems, that could be the case for Linear B2. There's no reason to say that it wasn't. However, that doesn't mean that we have any positive signs of writing outside of administration. So it seems to me to be a very restricted, um, probably elite controlled context of writing. Now, it's also worth saying that when Linear B was lost, that loss appears, as far as we can tell, to have been quite sudden. So writing doesn't survive the collapse of the administrative complexes um, and the sort of socio-economic features surrounding them around 1200 BCE or so. Um, so when those administrative complexes are lost, the place of writing also appears to be lost. So restricted usage here seems to correspond with low vitality and high vulnerability to loss. Now, I'm going to just move on to Cyprus. Um, I'll begin with the Bronze Age very briefly. Uh, so writing was borrowed from the Aegean in the sense that it seems to be Linear A that provided the template for what we call Cipro Minoan in Cyprus. Um, however, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an unthinking borrowing of wholesale writing practices. Cypriot writing is really distinctive, um, both from writing in the Aegean and from writing around the Near East, which, as we saw on the map earlier, Cyprus is very close to areas using cuneiform and so on. Um, so there are interactions with writing practices in those areas, but at the same time, Cyprus is really distinctive. There are distinctive types of clay documents, um, like the tablet, cylinder and clay balls shown here. And there's a wide range of other inscribed object types, some from the religious sphere. So the, um, the cow figurine here, um, is one sort of nice example and there are and there are others but we also see writing from what look like trading contexts so particularly on clay vessels um, we see prestige items like the gold ring at the top left here um, an inscribed ingot so thinking about the cypriot copper trade um, 
uh, a bronze ring stand at the bottom right here. There are lots of different types of inscriptions, small numbers of each. So we only have around 250 surviving inscriptions. However, um, it looks as though types of, um, of inscription um, have a sort of fairly wide outlook. So people who were writing didn't think that writing was only for one use. They clearly thought that it was for use in lots of different contexts. Now, I'll move straight on to the Cypriot syllabary. So the Cypriot syllabic script was a direct continuation from Cipro Minoan. So unlike in the Aegean, literacy continues across the end of the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. Uses of writing change over time and Cypriot syllabic writing actually adapts to those very well. So we see Phoenician is also used on the island. And with Phoenician, we see other inscription types like um, tombstones, for instance, are a, a new thing um, uh, around this time. Now, we see those in Cypriot syllabic writing too. Monumental inscriptions um, begin to become very important in the landscape. So sorry. Let's go back to that slide. Um, bottom right, you have the Italian bilingual, which is famously used to, um, to decode the Cypriot syllabic script. Um, so that has Phoenician and Cypriot syllabary. Top right, um, a funerary inscription. And at the bottom here, the famous Italian bronze, which is probably in a, um, imitative of a wooden type of document. So we have evidence that this shape of document would have been made in wood, but this is sort of bronze uh, version meant to last. And writing was very clearly used for a wide range of uses. So here you see a votive ear with an inscription. So um, uh, pro probably for um, ear health, I assume, um, and an earring in the top right. Um, a seal just underneath it, a coin. So we get we get coinage. We get um, we get royal dynasties using writing as a kind of signature. You know, they're they're making political monumental inscriptions and they're issuing coinage. Um, on the right next to it, a graffito on a piece of pottery. Bottom left are probably administrative. Um, Ostrakan and bottom right another piece of graffiti um, this time from Egypt so there are um, Egyptian monuments that have Cypriot syllabic graffiti several of them including the Great Pyramid has, has got one as well um, so Cypriots clearly were literate enough to go abroad write down their name or a short message um, and some of those ones from Egypt, we think, came from mercenaries as well. So probably, you know, not people of upper social strata. Seems like literacy was much more widely spread. And that seems to have something to do with the longevity of writing, too. We even find depictions of people writing. So there's a couple of examples on the right here. Um, so, the, you know, for, for the Bronze Age, writers are very anonymous. Once we get to Iron Age Cyprus, we now see what writing looks like when you do it. And these people are clearly writing on something like papyrus as well. So again, perishable materials. So syllabic writing on Cyprus seems to have had considerably higher vitality than at least what we can reconstruct for linear B. Um, it was in use for hundreds of years uh, in the first millennium BCE. And it had very wide ranges of usage and of users, as far as we can tell, across multiple social strata, as I said. Now, it is true to say that Cypriot syllabic writing was lost in the end, but it suffered a slow death, not a sudden one as uh, things appear for Linear B. So first, people in Cyprus, particularly royal dynasties, started to get interested 
in wider Mediterranean politics and particularly the Greek speaking world where the Greek alphabet was used at this time. And they started to occasionally introduce the alphabet into inscriptions from the fifth century BC onwards. Then at the end of the fourth century BCE, following Alexander the Great's death, Cyprus became part of the Ptolemaic administration. Um, and under the Ptolemies, now any official inscriptions would be issued not in the local Cypriot dialect and script, but in the Greek um, alphabetic koine, so a, Mediter a Mediterranean wide variety um, of, of Greek. Now, we do actually have late inscriptions from Cyprus that come from the religious sphere, which is kind of interesting because that seems to be where syllabic writing held out for the longest. Um, and these inscriptions show us that syllabic writing actually continued until at least the second century BCE. Um, and who knows exactly at what point it was lost. Probably by this point, there were people who were kind of digraphic in, or biscriptal in that they could use more than one writing system, um, as well as more than one variety of Greek, quite possibly. Um, the, the local ancient dialect of Cyprus also died out, in fact, probably around the same time as the writing system, as far as we can tell. Certainly, they had a close relationship and there seems to have been an issue of sort of identity involved. So that Cypriot syllabic script for a long time expressed Cypriot identity, but towards the end, under the Ptolemaic administration, and as the generations went by, presumably people saw the sense in mostly using the Greek koine and the Greek alphabet, um, and so passed it on less and passed their own um, local dialect and the Cypriot syllabic writing system onto their children less and less as time went on. So a slow death rather than a sudden one. Now, I'm just very briefly going to return to some of the questions I uh, raised at the beginning. Has this helped us to think about the vitality of writing traditions? Well, there are some points that we can make um, that may not seem um, too difficult to grasp. So transmission is important, education, training, literacy. So particularly we've been looking at how not just a question of how many people can and do write um but that is something that is very often focused on so kind of looking at it as a proportion of uh, the population state support is important so um as we've seen for both the linear b and the cypriot syllabic cases and also access to materials and tools um, that are needed to write but also ideological connections are important. Um, attitudes to writing, the social visibility, um, as I said, seems to be a significant difference between linear A, which survived in as much as it was sort of adopted um, and turned into linear B, whereas linear B with its very low social visibility seems to have died out suddenly. Um, and for Cyprus, a slower death rather than a sudden one for something that was for a long time very highly socially visible and probably lost social visibility towards the end under the Ptolemies. Um, attitudes to writing are clearly very important and also how varied and how adaptable the uses of writing are. So I think there are some valuable lessons there that we can feed back. Um, and I will just mention something that Marie-Christine mentioned at the beginning, namely the Endangered Writing Network. And this is the forum where I'm trying to um, sort of find people who are interested in thinking about how ancient world research might impact on efforts in the modern day to maintain and even revitalise writing traditions associated with endangered and minority languages. Um, for which we have several partners. So I will just show a brief slide for um, 
and I will finish there. Thank you very much for your attention. Philippa, thank you very much indeed for a most interesting uh, presentation. Um, we've had a comment from Professor Gardner, and she's saying that the struggle to find a written form, which you refer to in the contemporary context, is mediated by a key concept, standardization. Spoken languages show huge internal variation, and speakers do not always agree as to which version of their language should be standardized mm -hmm. and hence written down. Would you like to comment on her comment? Thank you. Yes, that's that's an excellent comment and um, and and clearly very true. So if we look at some uh, modern attempts to create um, a, an orthography or, or writing system for um, a new language, what we sometimes see is that it's very difficult for people using different dialects or different varieties um, to agree on what the standardized form should be. So the modern Mayan languages are a really important case in point where people have often gone in different directions. I think standardization is, is really important there. Now, it's not something that I've sort of mentioned really tonight, but is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, standardization for the ancient world is something that we clearly do see and something that is often mediated through training. Now, the degree to which you therefore need um, some sort of controlling factor, so perhaps a political regime, perhaps elites who um, who sort of control kind of what, what writing is for, that is a more difficult question, I think, because a standard needs to come from somewhere and needs to be uh, disseminated in some way. Linear B is very highly standardized. That doesn't mean that there's no variation within it, but it's very highly standardized. Even Cypriot syllabic writing was very highly standardized, in fact, and there was general agreement um, across various groups of people living it under slightly different political regimes in that um you know the the different city kingdoms were autonomous from each other just as we think of um, mycenaean centers but nevertheless there seemed to be a common acceptance of the writing tradition and also its rules right down to in Cypriot syllabic writing what direction you write in um, depending on where you come from so Paphian writing is left to right writing across most of the rest of the island is right to left um, so there are there are differences there and there's clearly a degree of standardization too now that's something that I'm actually looking to work on a bit further in the future so perhaps I won't say too much more at this stage, but um, but yeah, a very important point, I think. Okay, I sort of myself would quite like to ask, because I'm sure is an extremely mundane question, but if you look at the people who are writing Linear B and are concerned with the contents of stirrup jars or the movement of goods and things like that and the storing of things, does that imply that those people were part of an elite or because, I mean, if you look at it the other way, you could think, well, really, they probably weren't terribly elite, but had masters who were more elite than them. It's it's very difficult, I think, to, to pin down the concept of elite, of, uh, of kind of elite practice, especially in relationship to writing. I think we're quite used also to thinking about other societies around the Mediterranean and what writing meant there so you know in, in Egypt for example you see a certain disconnection between some elites and some specialists in writing who could have been perfectly high status individuals and often they certainly were um, but the, there's a kind of disconnect sort of across the social spectrum I think um, and for areas using cuneiform too, we see people specialising in writing. They won't all have been high status, but some of them will. Um, for the Aegean, writers are so anonymous that it's very difficult to tell. Now, we do have for Linear B, at least um, a, a, a reconstruction that um, allows us to 
to pin down two of the most common hands as um as identified paleographically so these are individuals identified by their handwriting um and they are identified with names found in the tablets um on various kind of contextual uh bases now that makes it look as though these individuals who can write and who do write are also relatively high status administrators since they seem to have um sort of extensive administrative duties now whether that means they're part of the elite is a a, a whole extra step in a sense what do we mean by the elite you know we're we only talking about people in the very upper echelons of society who are um, so, you know, the one acts in, in Moissanian society and so on, the ones who um, have both the ideological control and the resource control sort of under their fingertips. Well, I mean, actually, there's probably a much more complex situation than that, I suspect. So I think some writers may well not have been elites, but it depends sort of on what period and what writing system and what writing tradition you're you're talking about um but in many cases it's actually quite difficult to get writing away from um what seem to be elite uses um and that means that you know it's very hard to detect people kind of lower down the social strata so it's a, it's a complicated question i think and so difficult to reconstruct sort of who these elites were there's a very nice article by um sarah finlayson um on on this um, question which um which i found quite inspiring well Philippa, i'd like to thank you very much for what was a totally absorbing uh lecture and brought up many points of interest. Um, on behalf of everybody at the British School at Athens, I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to you. And just before we all sign off, I would just like you to remind everybody who listened to the lecture to the donate button, because at the end of the day, British School at Athens is a charity and we badly need your support. So if you could press the donate button, uh, we would um, really very much like you to. And the final thing I want to say before we sign off is that our next lecture is going to be on the 4th of July, and it's a hybrid lecture um, on Zoom and also in, um, in, uh, in person in the Senate room of Senate House, and it will be James Whitley speaking to us uh, about his work in Crete. So um, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you very much, Philippa. It's been a delight. Thank you.